Let's begin the second talk of this morning. And the speaker is Professor Christoph Eirau. And he will give a talk on Newton on degeneracy, local terminus, and Whitney ex singularity. Thank you very much Thank for you, the introduction. Have a nice it talk. Okay. Yes, it's working. Um, I would like to thank the organizer for this invitation. Um, it's always a great pleasure to visit Brazil and meet many friends. So today I will explain a joint work with uh, Mutsuoka. So in this talk, F, T, Z, uh, I mean F, T, Z1, Zn will be a polynomial function. On C time Cn, such that F T and zero equal zero for any T. As usual, I will denote by F index T of Z. This will be F, T, and Z. And I'm interested in the one parameter family of such function as the parameter T varies. So to each uh, such a function, I can associate the zero set, VFT, FT minus one, zero, which define a hypersurface in CN. So the goal of the talk is to study the local geometric properties of the hypersurface VFT as the parameter T varies. I will not do that for any function, but I will consider only the function that behave well with respect to their uh, Newton diagram. So, for families, um, so for family VFT, that behave well, I will explain what this means, with respect to their Newton diagram, possibly non-compact non Newton diagram, possibly non-compact Newton diagram. Okay, so the very first theorem I would like to mention in this direction is a theorem by Briansson. <coughs> by local here, I mean uh, germ at the origin, small representative of germ at the origin. I will not mention that anymore, but my study is just local near the origin, yeah? So the theorem of Briansson says, suppose that for all small t, we have the following three conditions. First, uh, FT has an isolated singularity. At the origin. Second, the Newton diagram of FT is independent of T. And finally, we assume that FT is non-degenerate.
then Brian Song showed that the family of the hypersurfaces VFT, as T varies, is Whitney equisingular. So, most of you know all the terms in this uh, uh, theorem, but let me just uh, recall briefly the definition just to fix the notation. Uh, so I will write my function ft, which is a polynomial, as a sum alpha, c alpha, z alpha. Alpha is here as multi-index. Huh? So this is sum alpha equal alpha 1, alpha n, c alpha, and z alpha is just a notation for z1 alpha 1, z n alpha n. Then you know the Newton polyhedron. Ft, usually we denote it by gamma plus Ft, and this is just the convex hull in Rn plus of the union of set for non-zero coefficient of the set alpha plus Rn plus. And then we can define the Newton diagram of Ft, sometimes some time called the Newton boundary of Ft, which is the union of compact faces of this polyhedron. Usually we denote it by gamma Ft. So this is union of compact faces of the Newton polyhedron. So now to define the non-degeneracy, I will do it in the following way. Let's consider a weight vector, say W. So by this, I mean a tuple of n integer elements. So they are n, n. I assume that they are not all zero. And associated to this weight vector, I can define a phase, delta W, Ft, as follows. I take all the alpha in gamma plus Ft, such that the sum Wi alpha i is minimal. Minimal makes sense because I, I am on the Newton polyhedron. So this defines uh, a phase of the Newton polyhedron, but not necessarily a compact phase. Uh, this is possibly non-compact phase of the Newton polyhedron. If all uh, the points here, W1, W2, Wn, are strictly positive, then it defines a compact phase of the Newton polyhedron. So we say that the function f, t, in all this definition, t is fixed. Huh? t is fixed. We say that f, t is non-degenerate. If, for any positive, strictly positive, if, for any positive weight vector, W, the phase function of Ft with respect to this weight, so this is a function that I will denote by Ft W, is just the sum of C alpha, Z alpha, but alpha varying only in this phase. So Ft is non-degenerative for any positive weight vector, the phase function, like that, 
has no critical point. in the zero set of V T W intersected with C star N. It's the same as saying that it has no critical point on C star N by the earlier identity. Okay, so now we have all the definition and under all these conditions, um, Briansson proved that uh, the family is Whitney equisangular. So what Whitney equisangular means in this case So we say that the family VFT is Whitney equisangular if there exists a witness stratification of the big hypersurface Vf, so this is F minus one zero, and it's lie in C times Cn, such that the T axis, so C times zero, is a stratum. So for family of isolated singularity, we get Whitney equisangularity provided that we have constancy of the Newton diagram and um, non-degeneracy which involve only the compact phase of the Newton diagram. Now when we want to switch to non-isolated singularity, we should have of course the same condition plus something else, we should also take into account the non-compact phase of the Newton diagram. And this, that's what I want to explain now. So to do that, I have to introduce a notion which is called local timeness. Local timeness condition. So let me fix some notation. If I um, is any subset in one N, this N is the N of uh, CN here, we usually denote by CI the set of points in CN so that ZI equals zero if I is not in capital I. And I will denote by calligraphic V T, that will be the set of all the subset i, such that the restriction of ft to ci identically vanish. When we have that, we call ci a vanishing coordinate subspace. Vanishing coordinate subspace for Ft. So, definition. Maybe I start here. We say that the function Ft is locally tame. If there exists a positive number R, which depend on Ft, so maybe I write like that, such that for any I non-empty, 
let's say, uh, I1, IN, which belong to the FT. So CI is a vanishing space for FT. For any weight vector, W, W1, WN, with the set of index I corresponding to zero weight is given by my set capital I. And for any non-zero complex number associated with each of these index, so U I1, U I M, so these are non-zero complex number, sufficiently small, so this means that I assume the norm is less than my positive number, RFT. We have the following, so I summarize, FT is locally tame if there exists a positive number like that, such that for any I, for any W, for any non-zero complex number, UI1, UIM, the phase function uh, F, T, associated with W, has no critical point in V, F, T, W, intersected uh, not only with the torus, C star N, but I should fix the variable Z I1, Z I M equal to this fixed complex number. So the set of Z in C N such that Z I G equal U I G for J between one and N. So this is a function only on the complementary variable to this one. Eh? So the phase function has no critical point in this set as a function of the n minus m variables zi for i not belonging to i. And I will call uh, the largest uh, number like that, the radius of local tameness of FT. Largest RFT is called the radius of local tameness for the function FT. So the definition maybe looks a bit complicated like that, but let's work it on an example. So for instance, I can take FT equal Z1 square Z to three plus z one three z two square plus let's say t z one square z two four. So let's take something like that. So the Newton diagram is like that two three. Three, two, and two, four, two, four. So that is the Newton polyhedron of FT, gamma plus FT. And Let's check if this uh, function is locally tame in the sense of this definition. The first things we have to know is 
what are the vanishing space? So in this case, what are the possibility for i? i can be 1, 2, or 1, 2. So if I look the restriction of ft to c1, for example, of z1, 0, if z2 equals 0, I have 0, 0, 0. So this identically vanish. So 1 is a vanishing. A space for ft. One is a vanishing space for ft. What about two? <coughs> ft restriction to c2 is zero and z2. So we have put z1 equal zero here, here, and here. Again, I get zero, and this means that two is also a vanishing space for ft. And obviously, 1, 2 is not a vanishing space because it gives me the full function. 1, 2 is not a vanishing space. OK, so we have already checked uh, the first things here. So now let's take a weight so that uh, the set of index with weight equal 0 correspond to uh, first we will treat 1 and then uh, look at 2. Maybe I write here. So I take W, W1, W2, with W1 equals 0. I consider the case where I is given by 1. I is given by 1. So what is the corresponding phase function? So this is the set of alpha in the Newton polyhedron, such that uh, w2 alpha 2 is minimal. So if I come uh, to this diagram, uh, Omega 2 is fixed. Omega 2 alpha 2 is minimal if I move in this phase. Yeah? So this is my delta W FT. And you observe that it is a non compact phase. Non compact phase. OK, and now let's fix a non zero complex number u1, non-zero. And let's look at the function of the complementary variable. So z2 give f t w, the phase function associated with w, of u1, z2. We are on this phase. So we have only one point here, which is uh, 3 and uh, 2. So we have u1, 3, z2, uh, square. Uh, obviously, if you take the derivative of that, the only way to get 0 is that zero, uh, z2 equals 0. So this function has no critical point on v, f, t, w intersected with the set of z in C star 2, so that Z1 is fixed to U1. And we have, this is true for any com non zero complex number. We have no restriction. There is no R in this case. So now let's consider the case I equal 2. So I take another weight vector, W prime, W1 prime, W2 prime, and with uh, w2 prime equals 0. So in this case, the phase delta w prime ft is the set of alpha in the Newton polyhedron so that w1 prime alpha 1 is minimal. 
and clearly, if we look at the picture, this time we get this non-compact phase. So this is delta W prime Ft. Okay, so, uh, so again, this is non-compact phase. And now we look, we take any non-zero complex number U2 in C star, and we look the function of the complementary variable. Z1 give Ft W prime of uh, Z1 U2, which is equal to what? Uh, we have these two points, so we have uh, uh, Z1 square uh, U2 cube plus T Z1 square U2 in the power 4. So if we look at the derivative of this map, we have 2 Z1 U2 cube factor 1 plus T U2. And if you want this equal to zero, this term will be never zero if we assume that u2 is less than one over t, for t not equal zero, for t equal zero is never zero. And so uh, the only way to get zero is that z1 is equal to zero. So if we impose the condition that u2 is non-zero and the norm of U2 is less than 1 over T, then this function has no critical point in VFT W prime intersected with the Z in C star 2 with Z2 equal U2. So altogether, we have proved that our function is locally tame. Ft is locally tame. And what is the number uh, Rft? It's just 1 over t. This is for t non-zero. If you want for t equal zero, there is no restriction. So you can write Rf0 is infinity. So the definition is a bit complicated, but uh, in fact, it's nothing to, to do. Just check if a function has a critical point or not. And with this notion, we can prove the following theorem. to Oka and myself. Suppose that for all small t, so one, the Newton diagram of Ft is independent of t. Second, Ft is non-degenerate. So these are the same assumption as in Brienson theorem. If we work with isolated singularity, we can stop here. If we want to include non-isolated singularity, we have to assume, in addition, that the function Ft is locally tame. But this is not enough to assume that each function ft is locally tame. We have to assume kind of uniformity with respect to the parameter in this local tameness. What uniformity means? Means that this number that I call rft here should be greater than some fixed positive number. So ft is locally tame, and um, not exactly this one, but the largest one, the radius of local tameness. Yeah. And the radius 
of local tameness of f t is greater than some r positive for some r positive which is independent of t. And under this condition, then again we get that the family VFT is Whitney equisingular. In particular, topologically equisingular. So this is the version of the Brianson theorem for non-isolated singularities. But there is kind of uh, weakness uh, in this theorem, if um, you have a function ft, which is the product of, say, two functions, ft1 times ft2, uh, you can assume that ft is convenient, for example. And if you look at the intersection V F one T intersection V F T two, every point in this uh, part is a singular point. This is contained in the singular locus of F T. Uh, so you can see that if the dimension of this at the origin is uh, greater than one, uh, then the function ft is never non-degenerate. Because there is a theorem of Kushnirenko, uh, if a function is convenient and non-degenerate, necessarily it has isolated singularities. So as soon as you have a product of two functions, you cannot apply uh, this theorem. So what I want to do now is to solve this situation and get a theorem for which we can apply uh, to this situation. And then we will have the largest class of uh, uh, non-isolated uh, function. Yeah. OK. So uh, suppose from now on that your function ftz is a product of, say, k0 function, f1 tz, f k0 tz. And again, I assume that f k t0 equal 0 for any k between 1 and k0 and for any small t. Then again, so we fix t for a while, and we have the following definition. We say that v f1 t f k0 t. Again, the germ of this is non-degenerate locally tame complete intersection variety
if we have the following. For any positive weight vector, W, so W1, Wn, V, F1, T, W, so the phase function associated to F1, T, etc., F, K0, T, W, intersected with C star N, is reduced non-singular complete intersection variety in the torus C star N. So this means that the K0 form df1 tw which product with df k0 tw is nowhere vanishing in this space so you can see that if you have only one function this coincide with the previous definition. Just means that uh, the one form has no critical point. Yeah. So this is the part that corresponds to non-degenerate complete intersection variety. So what is now locally tame complete intersection? There exists a positive number, which depends this time of all this function, f1 t, f k0 t, positive, such that, so we repeat almost the definition of local tameness. So for any i non-empty, say, i1, im, which is in the vanishing space for all the function, f1, t, intersection, v, f, k0, t. For any weight vector, W, Wn, such that the set of index corresponding to zero weight is equal to I. And for any non-zero complex number, so U, I, one, u, i, m, sufficiently small, so with the norm less than this positive number, f1, t, f, k0, t. So there exists R such that for any i, for any w, for any non-zero complex number, the toric variety V F one T W etc F K zero T W intersected with the set of point Z in C star N so that Z I J equal U I G again is reduced non singular 
complete intersection variety. Again, this means that uh, this K0 form is nowhere vanishing on this space. And one more time, if you have only one function, this coincides with the previous definition. So this is just a generalization of the hypersurface case to the case here of a complete intersection. And again, I will call the largest such a number, R, F1 T, F, K0 T. This is called the radius of <coughs> local tameness. For the tuple, F1 T, F, K0 T. So now I can state the last theorem. So again, this is in my paper with Oka. Let's assume that for all small t, uh, for all uh, this function, so for any k between 1 and k0, the Newton diagram of the function f k t is independent of t. Is independent of t. And second, any time you take a subset of such functions, so let's say for any um, k1, kp, so that is a subset in 1, k0, we have the following two conditions. V F K one T F K zero T is a non degenerate locally tame complete intersection variety. in the sense that I have just defined. And again, I have to assume that I have such a non-degenerate local time intersection variety uh, in a uniform way with respect to the parameter t. So which means that the radius of local timeness uh, here is greater than some positive fixed positive number which does not depend on t. So the radius of local tameness of the tuple F1 T F K0 T is greater than some R for some R positive and which is independent of t, independent of t and independent of this set. I want the same for all the set. And of k1, kp. So again, for one function, this is exactly the assumption of the previous theorem. And the conclusion is the same then the family VFT 
um, is Whitney equisingular. So now we have we are happy. We have solved this uh, bad situation, and we have a complete answer for non-degenerate function with possibly non-isolated singularity. Uh, let me insist on the fact that uh, um, Whitney equisangularity is quite a strong notion of uh, equisangularity. Uh, it implies topological equisangularity, uh, while the assumption are nothing but checking if a function has a critical point or not, or if a K0 form is vanishing or not. So you can even put this data in a computer, ask the computer uh, to check it, and then we give you the answer to the assumption. So this is something may maybe boring to do, but that can be done by a computer very easily for a quite strong conclusion. Uh, maybe I can give uh, quickly an example. Um, if I take FT something like Z1 <coughs> plus Z2 plus TZ23 and Z1 plus Z2 plus T. Maybe I put one here, I put two here, four, something like that. Uh, so if you look at the Newton diagram of uh, FT, you will have, you have this square here, so you will have two, two, and you have also one here. So the, the Newton polyhedron of FT looks like that. This is gamma plus FT. And if you look at uh, this phase here, delta, so you look at the restriction of FT at this phase. This is just uh, Z1 plus Z2 square. So in particular, the function FT is degenerate. So we cannot apply the previous theorem. We are in the situation of the second theorem. And obviously, if I call this function here F1T and this one F2T, obviously, these two functions are non-degenerate. F1t and F2t are non-degenerate. So to apply uh, the theorem, uh, we have to check that not only these two functions are non-degenerate, but the intersection also is non-degenerate. So if I take now the, the Newton polyhedron of each of these functions, this time I have here one, one, so the Newton polyhedron is like that. This is gamma plus F1t, which is the same as gamma plus F2t. So if you look the variety V F1t for the phase, uh, let me call this one maybe delta prime, and F2t delta prime, uh, what do you get? Uh, you have Z1 plus Z2 equals zero. This is obviously non-degenerate also. Hmm? Obviously non-degenerate. And the same, if you look this zero-dimensional phase, delta prime one and delta prime two, you can replace here one and delta prime two you get also obviously something non-degenerate. Yeah. So now we have to check if uh, these functions are locally tame. So what are the vanishing space? Again, I can be one, two, 
or one two. If you look at the restriction of F1 T to C1, so Z1 zero, uh, this is not identically zero. So one is not a vanishing space for FT1. If you look the restriction of FT1 to C2, so zero and Z2, again, you will have uh, zero here, but Z2 here, so this is not identically zero. And again, two is not a vanishing space for FT. And obviously, one, two is not a vanishing space because we get the full function. And we can see exactly the same thing, replacing F1 by F2. So there is no vanishing space. So if there is no vanishing space, the condition of local test mass is uh, empty, automatically satisfied. So altogether, this example satisfies all the conditions of the theorem. So it is the corresponding family, Sweetney Equisangular. So when I say at the beginning that a family is Sweetney Equisangular, means that we have a witness stratification of the big hypersurface. VF, the one who lie in C times CN. So what is this witness stratification? In fact, this is the obvious one. This is the canonical uh, toric stratification of VF. So uh, this is what I want to write now. So, the witness stratification stratification of VF uh, answering all the theorem is just the canonical uh, toric stratification of VF. So how it is defined? So first, we have to observe that uh, still near the origin of C times CN, um, subset of the form intersection for K in capital K. Capital K is any subset in one K zero, so any subset of my function F1, F2, FK zero. So the intersection uh, like that of set of the form VFK intersected with C time C star i, this is always non-singular, is non-singular. Maybe I didn't define c star i. c star i is the set of point z in cn, so that z i equals zero if and only if i is not in capital I. If I is a vanishing space, you have just that, so nothing to check. If it is not a vanishing space, there is a, a proof to do. This is not obvious at all, and it uses the non-degeneracy. It does not use the local tameness condition, only use the non-degeneracy. Use the non-degeneracy condition. So then, if this set are non-singular, you can see that uh, the collection then <laughs> the collection of all non-empty subset of the following form. 
So let's say S for strata, for stratum, depend on I and on K. So the set of point TZ in C time C star I such that F K T and Z equal zero if and only if K is in capital K. Or if you prefer, if I denote if I denote this set here by V star I F K. So this is the same as taking the intersection for K in capital K or V star I F K minus the union for K in the complement complement of K of V star I F K. So the collection of all non-empty subsets of this form is clearly uh, a complex analytic stratification. The complex analytic stratification of VF and uh, C times zero, the T axis, C times zero, which is given by, you take I empty set, and K, you take all the function. One, K zero, is a stratum. So this is what we call the canonical toric stratification. And for example, if you have something like that, so if this is the, the T axis, so you have the obvious one, you have the T axis and these four leaves like that. Basically, you, for example, if you have uh, the intersection of uh, uh, three plane in C3, what you take, you take the origin, then you take each coordinate axis minus the origin, then you take each plane minus the coordinate axis, and you take the intersection of your upper surface. That's the canonical toric stratification, yeah? So, and the theorem say that this complex analytic stratification satisfy with neighbor regularity condition. Um, <clears throat> I cannot give the proof of this theorem because it's quite complicated, but at least I can uh, point out some of the main difficulty that we have to, to do. So, we have to prove with neighbor regularity. So you take two uh, strata, S, I, K, and another one, S, let's say, G, L. You take the closure of one, and you suppose the intersection of these two is not empty. Then you take a point, tau, Q, there, and you should prove that uh, the big stratum is with neighbor regular over the small one uh, at this point. Uh, usually, to do that, we take an analytic curve here, say gamma s, and another analytic curve here, rho s, so these are analytic curves, such that gamma zero is rho zero is the point to Q. And if I uh, 
called uh, the line ls, which is rho s minus gamma s. We have to prove that the limit of this line, so say uh, l infinity, limit when s approach zero of the line, divided by the norm, belong to uh, the limit of the tangent space of this stratum. So limit s approaching zero of tangent space at the point rho s to the big stratum. So that what we have to to prove to prove a uh, Whitney with singularity. So this space, this space is um, you take the the wedge product of uh, this form df1 rho s df ah, l. Maybe to simplify, let me denote l just the first integer like one, two until kl, yeah. And then I have df kl at rho s. This is the orthogonal of this k0 form, yeah. And <coughs> if I denote, uh, so the limit exists, so I will denote maybe omega infinity. This will be the limit of the F1 rho s, the F kl rho s, maybe di divide by the order. And we have to show that omega infinity of L infinity is equal to zero. Uh, of course, we would like to check it with the independent limit that are in this wedge product. But the problem is that when, um, when S approach the origin, uh, the, the one form, DF1, DF2, DFK, may become linearly dependent. And this is the most uh, difficulty that we have to, uh, to solve. To do that, we proceed as follow. So, main difficulty, the one forms, df1, rho s, etc., df, kl, rho s, the, the limit, sorry, the limit of the one form may be linearly dependent. So to, sol to solve that, we substitute to d f k rho s the following, d f k rho s plus a sum for say l equal one to k minus one of some polynomial c k l s d f l rho s. And we can show that uh, we can choose this polynomial in such a way that if I expand this form like, uh, say, omega k s nu k plus uh, higher order term, then uh, this omega 1, omega 2, omega k l will be linearly independent. So here we can choose. Oh, it's here that we use the main assumption, the local tameness. So say, by local tameness, we can choose polynomial CKLS such that if I expand my form in this way, we have that omega 1, omega KL are linearly independent. 
and then we can write that omega infinity is the wedge product of this one form. So to check uh, uh, this condition, which is not easy at all, it's enough to check that for any k, omega k, omega k of L infinity is equal to zero. And this makes the proof uh, much simpler. So I think I will not explain more about the proof that I will stop here.